Darren Hovis here at Par4 Fitness. I'm joined by Elsa Clark, live from Brainton. We're going to be talking about periodization today and why is it important to not just you as a golfer, but really any athlete that we work with. So thanks for joining us today, Elsa. Thank you for having me. So let's just kind of dive right in. I know one of the things that we, we always talk about is, okay, what's the season like uh, for a player? Um, I know a lot of our, our golfers that we work with really don't have much of an off season or don't take too much of an off season. And golf is very different from other sports in general, just because um, they may have a tournament week, one week. So on those off weeks, you can also kind of create those and make those an off season training period and make some of those gains back. Um, so golf is very different than like uh, say the NFL for, for example, where you, you've got six days off in between uh, or more uh, per game. So you can kind of train in between there. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about this as we, as we move through this uh, for golfers in general. Um, but periodization is a, a really big deal in, in terms of training and what you should be doing. So take us away here, Elsa. So according to the Essentials of Strength and Conditioning, um, which is the textbook that I have been working through in order to prepare for my national certification exam, periodization is defined as a theoretical and practical construct that allows for the systematic, sequential, and integrative programming of training interventions into mutually dependent periods of time in order to induce specific physiological adaptations that underpin performance outcomes. So when we talk about periodization, we can think of it in different time periods. Um, the, as we'll talk about later on, the most general is a one year um, macro cycle. So we typically have annual training plans that can be two to four years, um, depending upon the kind of sport. So if we think about, um, you know, the NFL, they have a preseason. So when did they start training? Probably July, August timeframe would be their preseason when they get back together, they start working. Um, and then, you know, September, October, we start getting into games. Um, and then the playoffs come around February, March. I'm trying to think of when the time frame is now that everything is all um, crazy. But they consistently have a, a preseason, in season, an off season and a post season. Uh, so in, in each of those periods, then the athlete is working through different things. And as we approach a um, in season perspective, we're getting more sport specific. So we're increasing the level of sport activity, making it more consistent with that sport and the activities that are needed. So in golf, it's a little different just because we don't really have one exact season. Um, we don't really have segments of season. So if you think about the college golfer, um, they're competing all the time. We compete in the fall. We compete in the spring. Um, we compete in the summers. And even at Christmas, there's a couple tournaments that are offered. So it's just, it's different for us. Um, so we kind of have to take our off seasons where we get them. So everything that's going on right now with, this virus, um, this is the longest off season that a lot of us have had because we don't really know when we're going to be playing again. We're unsure, but we know that throughout this time, it's important in order to make the games that we need in order to be prepared once this time comes. So in periodization, our number one goal is to reduce overtraining. So we don't want to spend one period of time focused on building muscle and um, increasing strength because eventually our body's going to shut down and it's going to be overloaded. Um, and the second thing is we want to reduce the risk of injury. So we want to make sure that we're maintaining our strength um, but not going overboard with it. Yeah, in a recent webinar we did with Troy Van Beesen, who's a chiropractor on the PJ Tour, works with Tiger, uh, Ricky, JT, Jordan Spieth, um, he, he's saying that recovery is really the biggest thing uh, that they're advocates of on the PGA Tour, and it's something that the PGA Tour players have really picked up over the last couple of years, um, whether it's looking at like the whoop wristbands and heart rate variability, um, looking at inflammation factors and things like that that are, are going to really indicate what, at what 
level is that athlete operating at and how well are they recovered? And that, that goes into the overtraining and also reducing the risk of injury with these athletes that don't get much of an off season. Um, so something to keep in mind as a, uh, as a recreational player as well. So there are three theories um, behind each uh, behind each understanding of periodization, if you will. So the first one is going to be the general adaptation syndrome. So the general adaptation syndrome is combined of three stages. So we have an alarm stage, a resistance stage, and an exhaustion stage. So when we think about this, um, the alarm phase occurs as our initial response to exercise. So as we're exercising, we're accumulating fatigue, we're accumulating soreness, we're accumulating stiffness in our bodies. So think about the first time that you ever did a workout or maybe the first round of perform that we did. So we're moving extremely fast paced, maybe strengthen, you're using weights, you're increasing your weights to something that you wouldn't usually use. Um, so your body is going to be fatigued. It's going to be more tired. It's going to be a little bit more sore. So that's going to be a, the alarm phase. Your body's telling you, hey, I'm sore. This is what happened. And then we're going to move into the resistance phase, which is where the body is going to adapt to the stimulus and able to return to normal functioning capacity. So let's say we're doing bicep curls with two 10-pound weights. We got a 10-pound in one hand, 10-pound in the other. We're doing bicep curls. Um, we're able to do 12 reps consistently. And so then the next time, we're going to go up in weight to 15, but we might only do eight or 10 reps. So as we're doing this, then our body over time is eventually going to become accustomed to doing this, this um, additional weight. So the 15 pounds is going to become the 10 pounds. And then when we go to 20, it's going to happen again. So that is our resistance phase. And if the training is properly structured, then we're going to increase our level of strength. We're going to increase our level of performance. However, if the stress continues for an extended period of time and our body's not responding the way that it should be, it's going to go into this exhaustion phase. So this is where the body responds negatively to the stressor. It's not able to adapt. And over time, it's going to cause an increased risk of overtraining um, where the body just completely shuts down, can't train, and we have to start back over with all of our, our strength gains and every single additional strength. Um, so the primary goal for us as strength and conditioning professional, professionals is to avoid the exhaustion phase. Um, so we, we don't want to do that. We want the body to continue to avoid understand and to continue to respond in the proper way that we want it to respond. So the magnitude of the workload, the more fatigue that we're going to experience. So if we go back to the example of the dumbbells, we're increasing from 10 to 15. We're increasing the stimulus. We're increasing the magnitude of the workload. And eventually our body delay this fatigue, the longer that we delay the body, the more, um, the less chance our body's going to recover at a faster rate. So our third theory is called the fitness fatigue paradigm. So for every training session, we have, we're going to have fitness and we're going to have fatigue. So if we go back to the general adaptation syndrome where we're talking about the alarm resistance phase, then as we increase our level of fitness, so as we're increasing from the 10 pounds to the 15 pounds, we are increasing our level of fitness, but in order to do that, we're also going to increase our level of fatigue. However, when we increase both of these, our state of preparedness decreases because in order to increase our level of fitness, our performance is going to be reduced at first until we become accustomed to the phase, we become accustomed to the level that we're lifting, and eventually our preparedness will increase over time. Right, right. So basically every session doesn't need to be to complete exhaustion. We can, we can challenge our, our volumes and, and alter them based on what phase we're in uh, exactly. to avoid these things. So this is an example um, from the textbook 
So when we go through periodization, we have these different periods of time. So a multi-year plan could be two to four years, um, but typically we follow an annual training plan. So when we break it down, one annual training plan is composed of multiple macro cycles, and then each macro cycle is composed of multiple mesocycles, so on and so forth. So, excuse me, in the annual training plan, the annual training plan and the macro cycle, they can be considered very similar, um, but both of them refer to the preparatory competitive transition periods. So that if you think about it in terms of a football player, that would go back to your preparatory would be your preseason, competitive in season, and then transition would be the postseason and off season time period. So then when we break this down to a mesocycle, a mesocycle is typically two to six weeks. Um, however, it can be longer, can be shorter. It just depends upon the kind of training that the individual is doing. So let's say our mesocycle is going to be um, four weeks for the PGA Tour golfer who's on the road. So during this time, he has to understand okay, during this time, my mesocycle is going to be broken down into different microcycles. Micro so I'm going to have one microcycle where I'm constantly playing four days in a tournament. And then Monday, Tuesday, I'm going to go a little bit lighter in my microcycle, um, several days of training focused on um, fundamentals of the golf swing for in preparation for the next weekend whenever he starts back going. And then we can divide those into training days and training sessions. So a lot of PGA Tour players, when they're on the road, they when they're in competition season, they might work out once in the morning, whereas on the days where they're not playing or they're only practicing, they might work out in the morning and at night. So those can be your training sessions combined to create your training day. Yeah, some, some great advice for just the athlete looking to maybe decide how they want to look at their, their year. Um, I know when I, I get a professional in the studio, I'll always go through the entire year. I mean, that, that's basically our, our first conversation. What are, what's your schedule going to be like? What's, and oftentimes it's, there's a lot that's up in the air with, with the players that we're working with. Um, throughout many tours, there's a lot of uh, different qualifiers and, and the sorts like that. And I know you as a college player go through some of the same things. So you plan out a year, but that sometimes changes. So you, you have this general sense of what the schedule is going to look like. Um, but it, it, could, it could change from, from week to week even based on what you're, what you're qualifying for and what you're, you're taking the time. Exactly. Um, so it's, this is flexible. Um, but use this as a general plan to um, basically guide you throughout your, your training cycle as well. So in regards to the periods of periodization, we have a preparatory period, and within the preparatory period, there's a hypertrophy and a basic strength phase. And then we move into first transition, which is going to be a strength power phase, and then competition period, and then second transition, which would be active rest. So our preparatory period is considered our off-season um, period. So for right now, for the golfers, these, this time can be considered our off-season, um, where we're still trying to develop a base level of conditioning to increase our ability later on down the road to have more intense training. Um, so typically, as we progress through, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the slides, but as we progress through from off-season to pre-season to in-season, our training is going to get a little bit more intense from off-season to pre-season. And then as we go into competition, we're going to back off a little bit on the conditioning and focus more on the sport-specific movement of it. So we're going to start off with lower intensities here um, and higher volumes. So this is just an example um, of different percentages that we can use as an example of intensity and the number of sets and reps for um, the athlete in regards to volume. But within our hypertrophy phase, hypertrophy is typically the first couple weeks of the preparatory phase. Our main goal here, we want to increase our body mass and we want to develop an endurance um, base. So we're using this time to prepare for later. 
when the basic strength phase, we want to increase the strength of muscles that are essential to primary sport movements. So for the golfer, we might be focused more on the lower body, um, focused on building the quads and the hamstrings. Whereas for a uh, weightlifter, you know, they might be doing full body. Um, it just depends on the sport and the kinds of muscles that are required in order to generate the best power in each sport. Yeah, that can vary based on the, the weakness of the player as well. If they've got something that's maybe more injury prone than, um, than another player, then you can kind of tailor your training based on the individual athlete too. Exactly. So when we go into the first transition period, our primary goal is shifting our strength um, and its translation into power. So we're transitioning, this, this period of time serves between off season and competition. So as we go through this, we're eventually going to reduce our volume, reduce our intensity in order to have that period of time at the end where we can recover before entering into competition phase. And as we move through this, we're going to, like I said, go back into that sport specific mo movement. So for the golf swing, we might start off at the beginning doing general strength building exercises, general um, agility-based exercises, and then as we move into it, we're going to focus more on single to double leg or generating power, working on those load explode components that we need in the golf swing. Uh, once we reach the competitive period, so we could think of the competitive period as for golfers as the summertime. Um, you know, if you're a college golfer, comp competition period is kind of all the time, um, but if you're a summer golfer or if you're, um, you know, a PGA Tour player, they really want to play their best golf between the months of April and July. Those are when the majors are, so those are considered their competition period. Um, so here we want to increase our strength and power by increasing level of intensity and decreasing in volume. So we're going back to that fitness fatigue paradigm, every single exercise training we're going to increase our level of fitness, but we're also going to have an increase in the level of fatigue. So in doing so, we really want to balance these two out. We don't want to be, if you will, on a roller coaster of increased fitness, but fatigue, increased fitness, but fatigue. You know, you kind of want to keep everything level so that then we can produce our um, best results. So our athletes are going to focus on sport specific activity. And then there are two different components of the competitive period. There's a peaking period and a maintenance period. So peaking, we put the athlete in peak condition usually one to two um, weeks before competition. So you can think about this in terms of a swimmer. Um, so swimmers typically um, want to be playing their best whenever or swimming their fastest right before competition season. So they're going to focus on keeping the high to low intensities between 50 and 93%, keeping the volume low one to three sets. So we're conserving that energy a couple weeks prior to competition so that when we enter into the competition, we're ready to go, we're at our strongest, we're at our fastest. And then maintenance is the other component of this. So we're maintaining, we're staying steady, we're not, like I said, we're putting back that fitness fatigue paradigm where we're going up and down, we're staying nice and balanced throughout the entire thing generating optimal levels of fitness and optimal levels. Yeah, and when you look at golf, the, and the best players in the world are the ones that are, are, have the advantage of really planning out the majors. So those are the ones that they're peaking for, right? So they're, they're not playing as many events as, uh, say, a player that's looking to win every week or try to win every week. They're just trying to, to make as much money as they can so they can they can maintain their tour card. This, this maintenance phase gets a, a lot more fuzzy for that type of player, whereas a Brooks Kepka or Tiger Woods, they can plan out their year and say, okay, in, in April, I want to peak for the Masters. June's the Open. Uh, July's uh, British Open. And then I've got the PGA after that, and then the playoffs. So they can go through this period and really break these down uh, much more easily than a player that's struggling just to maintain um, competitive, that competitive edge from, from week to week because they've got to perform uh, every week in order to, to up their rank and, and up their, uh, their competitiveness in the, uh, their world rankings.
So finally, we go into the second transition period, which is the active rest period. So here we're using this as an unloading period for the athlete. Um, so there's two different ways we could do this. We could do this in chunks. So the athlete could go through um, a max, a max or a meso cycle of uh, com competition season for three or four weeks and then have one week of this off and then three or four weeks, one week off. That's typically what the golfer does. Um, but if we're like a basketball player, then the basketball player can go for two to three months, sometimes four, depending upon how playoffs go, um, constantly playing and then use this one to four week period at the end after all of that um, in order to recover from the competition they've just experienced. Um, but the number one rule here is that if the athlete does transition, we say four weeks, if the athlete experiences the second transition or active rest time for longer than four weeks, it takes them even longer to get back to the level they were originally at. So they're going to require a longer preparatory period in order to regain the gains they made in the season prior. So so once, oh, sorry, go ahead. So once the competition season ends, um, we're going to decrease our level of training. We're just going to be doing a lot of basic movements, allowing the athletes to rehabilitate, rest physically, mentally, moving away from the sport specific movements and doing other recreations. Yeah, and this is kind of one of my issues with the change in schedules because during the summer and into the fall, there's not much rest period, um, even for the top level players at this point, because you've got, you've got majors back to back and Ryder Cups, President's Cups, Olympics, um, playoffs. I mean, it's, it's all kind of condensed into this three to four month area. Um, and you don't get the break until um, like Thanksgiving, right before Thanksgiving. Um, so you'll see some of these players on the PGA Tour take that time off um, and, and they won't return until January. So they have some decompression like Elsa just talked about and then they can get back into to training again but I think that might be something that becomes problematic going into this next season because we're looking at sports that are kind of pushed back and it's even more condensed and there's the possibility of a very short off season uh, before we get back into the the 2021 season so some of these athletes might might run the risk of overtraining and, and kind of hitting that burnout phase. So I think the top level players will obviously have the the comfort of um, managing this a little bit better than the ones that are are struggling to keep their cards. Um, but it could be a problem uh, with with the current schedule and the changes that have had to been made. So general concept of periodization, um, I've said this a little bit before, but as we progress through each period, as we move from preparatory first, competition second, then our volume is going to decrease. Our sets and reps are going to decrease, but our intensity is going to increase. So we're still going to be able to maintain um, our level of strength as we move from preparatory to first competition. Um, and then our amount of sport specific movement is going to increase. However, after that competition period, when we move into the active rest, then, excuse me, it's okay for our volume to increase a little bit, intensity decreases, sport specific movement decreases. So that period of time from competition to second, these um, rules kind of flip. And so that allows for the athlete to recover, recuperate, rehabilitate during this time. Excellent. So some great concepts to, to use with your training. Um, this is basically the, the rules and guidelines that, that we'll follow when, when dealing with a player uh, throughout the year uh, on the amateur stage or even up to the professional ranks. Um, so use this as, as general advice um, to, to throw into your training. And uh, thank you, Elsa, for putting this together for us. Yeah, of course.